Good evening, I'm Amna Nawaz. Judy Woodruff is away. On the news hour tonight, protesters in Hong Kong bring one of the world's busiest airports to a standstill as fears grow over a Chinese military crackdown. Then new threats of extinction as the Trump administration changes the rules of the Endangered Species Act. And on the ground at the Iowa State Fair, where butter sculptures and 2020 presidential hopefuls vie for voters' attention. I agree with what Biden has to say, but I also agree with what Warren and what Sanders has to say. So I'm, right now I'm kind of conflicted. All that and more on tonight's PBS NewsHour. Air traffic in Hong Kong was brought to a ground stop after a fourth day of protests inside the international airport. More than 150 flights were canceled. Thousands of anti-government demonstrators occupied the terminal, holding signs and chanting calls for democratic reforms. They're demanding the resignation of the territory's chief executive, Carrie Lam, and an investigation into police use of force. We'll have more on this after the news summary. The Trump administration finalized rollbacks on the Nixon-era Endangered Species Act today. The changes end automatic endangered species protection for those classified as threatened. They'll also allow economic cost to factor into whether or not a species should be protected. Conservation groups and at least 10 attorneys general have warned the move could put more wildlife at risk for extinction. We'll take a closer look at the impact of today's rollback later in the program. In economic news, a sell-off in the banking and technology sectors caused stocks to plunge on Wall Street today. The Dow Jones Industrial Average lost 391 points to close at 25,896. The Nasdaq fell more than 95 points and the S&P 500 slid 36. In eastern China, meanwhile, the death toll from a weekend typhoon has now risen to at least 45 people. Rescue workers are still evacuating residents stranded in buildings after their streets were submerged by floodwaters. Crews have been working to clean up debris left behind. Meanwhile, in southern India, days of torrential rain and mudslides have now killed nearly 100 people and displaced 400,000 others. In the worst hit state of Kerala, muddy water filled the roads as rescue workers in boats helped people to evacuate. At least one crocodile found refuge on the roof of a submerged home. It has been at least five to six days. Everybody is stuck in flooded villages. Animals and others all are stuck there. People are facing a lot of problems. Water has come from all directions. Water has entered all the houses. Local officials in the state of Karnataka said the flooding was the worst they'd seen in 45 years. In Congo, two experimental drugs are showing promise in the fight against Ebola. They're part of a clinical trial, rather, that began last November. The therapies are the first of their kind to treat patients who've already contracted the highly contagious disease. People who received the drugs shortly after becoming infected had a 90 percent survival rate. The Ebola outbreak in Congo killed more than 1,800 people over the past year. Back in this country, a friend of the gunman who killed nine people outside a bar in Dayton, Ohio, told investigators he purchased the body armor and ammunition that were used in the rampage. Federal prosecutors unsealed charges against Ethan Colley today, but they emphasized there was no evidence Colley knew about the shooter's plans. In the course of this ongoing investigation into the August 4th shooting, anyone who is discovered to have any criminal culpability for any act that ultimately uh, is discovered through the investigation or contributed in any way to the events on August 4th is going to be held criminally responsible. Colley was charged with lying on a federal firearms form used for an unrelated gun purchase. Also today, lawyers for comedian Bill Cosby appeared before a Pennsylvania appeals court in a bid to overturn his sexual assault conviction. They argued a judge denied Cosby a fair trial by letting additional accusers testify in a case that concerned only one allegation. The 82-year-old Cosby is now serving a prison sentence of three to ten years for drugging and assaulting a woman in 2004. A decision on the appeal is not expected for several months. Still to come on the news hour, how will the Chinese government respond to protesters in Hong Kong shutting down a major airport? Questions and conspiracy theories in the wake of billionaire sex offender Jeffrey Epstein's death. The Trump administration moves to radically reduce the amount of legal immigration to the U.S. 
Democratic hopefuls head to the storied Iowa State Fair and our Politics Monday team examines the state of the race, plus much more. Hong Kong's airport was shut down today, occupied by thousands of protesters. The authorities in Beijing again struck an ominous note, comparing the mass protest to terrorism. And as thousands of Chinese security personnel mustered on Hong Kong's border, Beijing declared there should be, quote, no leniency or mercy for the protesters. Jonathan Miller of Independent Television News reports. In air thick with tear gas, inside an underground station, Hong Kong police last night resorting to ever harsher tactics. These protesters had been attempting to flee. Across the harbour, outside a Kowloon police station, a protester was shot in the eye with a baton round from a police shotgun. Despite wearing protective goggles, her eyeball was ruptured, and there are fears she could lose her eye. Earlier, in the same location, Police fired tear gas from inside the station. A pitched battle ensued as protesters laid siege. Then this. Policeman inside suffered burns to his legs. Today, an infuriated Beijing lashed out, branding this terrorism. The State Council, China's cabinet, Ratcheting up the ruthlessness of the rhetoric, leaving no room now to back down. These were sinister and serious crimes, it said. Protesters reckless. Things had reached what the spokesman called a critical juncture. Such violent crimes must be resolutely cracked down on in accordance with the law. No leniency no mercy. We strongly support the Hong Kong police as they enforce the law strictly to bring the criminals to justice as soon as possible. There has been mounting alarm in Hong Kong over whether China might order the military onto the streets. But today, Communist Party papers released footage, complete with sinister soundtrack, showing convoys of people's armed police heading to Shenzhen on Hong Kong's northern border. These paramilitaries, under the command of the Central Military Council, headed by President Xi Jinping himself, have been used to put down protest, often brutally, in other restive regions. Growing outrage over police brutality led to thousands of demonstrators converging today on Hong Kong International Airport, one of the busiest in the world, forcing the total cancellation of all flights in and out. It's the protesters who are brutal, the police said today, exhibiting weapons they said were confiscated. Most Hong Kongers won't buy that now. The trust is broken. There are 28 years still to go before China can take full control of Hong Kong, but Beijing looks impatient to bring the territory under its authoritarian aegis. Among Hong Kongers, banks and businesses, a quiet but rising panic Attorney General William Barr today sharply criticized the management of the Manhattan Federal Jail, where wealthy financier Jeffrey Epstein was found dead in his cell this weekend. As John Yang reports, Epstein's death does not mean the end to the federal sex trafficking investigation that led to his indictment. Anda, in his remarks today, the Attorney General also pledged that any co-conspirators should not rest easy. The victims, he said, deserve justice and they will get it. So where does the case go now? Jessica Roth is a professor at Yeshiva University's Cardozo School of Law and joins us from New York. Jessica Roth, thanks. What do prosecutors in the case of the United States versus Jeffrey Epstein do now that Jeffrey Epstein is dead? 
Well, the case against Jeffrey Epstein himself will be dismissed because he's now deceased, and you can't proceed with a criminal case against a person who's dead. But the overall criminal investigation will continue. Uh, over the weekend, U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York, Jeff Berman, issued a statement in which he made clear that the criminal investigation would continue. And he uh, said that his office would continue to stand for the victims, stand up for the victims. And in particular, he pointed to the fact that Jeffrey Epstein had been charged in one count of the indictment with with conspiring with others to engage in sex trafficking. And that's significant, because the law of conspiracy require, requires proof that two or more persons agreed to commit a crime. And what that means is that Mr. Berman was prepared to prove in court that at least one other person, and possibly others, were engaged in a criminal conspiracy with Jeffrey Epstein. Well, we know that in that Florida, that highly criticized Florida non-prosecution agreement, uh, they named, were named four potential co-conspirators who were not charged. And in this New York indictment, there were three people uh, uh, cited, though not named, who also participated in this. Are we, you think we're likely to see indictments against uh, th those folks coming up in the coming days? I don't know about the timeline, but certainly from everything that's been indicated by the U.S. Attorney's Office and what's been publicly reported, it would seem that they have significant evidence, evidence against other people. Uh, as you mentioned in the indictment, there are people identified not by name, but in terms of the role that they played. So clearly, the U.S. Attorney's Office has evidence against those other people, and they will be pursuing that investigation and looking at also the evidence that was collected during the search of Jeffrey Epstein's homes that was done on the day of his arrest to see what that yield about the involvement of co-conspirators and accomplices. Uh, it's been reported that his pilots uh, have been subpoenaed for their testimony, and they would have significant information about who else may have been involved in arranging that travel uh, to facilitate the, tr the sex trafficking. So I think we need to be patient as the investigators reorient to a case in which Jeffrey Epstein will not be sitting at the, at the defense table. Uh, but Mr. Berman made clear that the investigation is ongoing. And even without a conviction, can prosecutors go after his assets, or in this case, I guess, his estate? Yes. So there is still a process in which the U.S. Attorney's Office, through which the U.S. Attorney's Office can go after assets that were used uh, to facilitate the crimes that have been alleged here. So, for example, his Manhattan townhouse allegedly was involved, uh, was used as a place where uh, some of the unlawful activity occurred. If his properties in the Virgin Islands were involved, those also could be sought through what's called a civil asset forfeiture proceeding. The advantage of that, first, is that it can be handled by the U.S. Attorney's Office, um, and any assets that are recovered distributed to victims for restitution through the federal government. The, it also allows proof by a preponderance of the evidence standard, which is the civil uh, uh, standard of proof rather than the criminal proof beyond a reasonable doubt standard. It also offers an advantage, frankly, of allowing the narrative of what unfolded in his crimes to be told, uh, because much of the same proof would be offered that would have been offered at a criminal trial against Jeffrey Epstein. And, of course, this doesn't do anything to the civil lawsuits that might be coming from accusers. No, those can proceed as well. So the 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 accusers have multiple avenues through which they can seek uh, some measure of justice. None of them will be the same, of course, of, as actually confronting Jeffrey Epstein in a criminal case. Um, but through the civil lawsuits, they can pursue uh, his estate. As I mentioned, um, the civil asset forfeiture proceeding against specific assets that were used to facilitate his crimes is another avenue of potential relief. And then, of course, as we discussed a moment ago, there's the possibility of criminal uh, proceedings against others who were his accomplices and co-conspirators. Jessica Roth of the Cardozo School of Law, thank you very much. Thank you. The Trump administration announced today that it plans to implement new immigration rules. As Yamiche Alcindor explains, it's one of the most aggressive steps yet to limit legal immigration. Today's new rule from the Trump administration limits who will be eligible for a green card in the United States. Under current law, immigrants are already required to prove that they are not what the government deems a, quote, public charge. Today, Ken Cuccinelli, the acting head of U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, announced the plans. He said any immigrants who use or who are deemed likely to use a number of public benefits may not be eligible for legal status. The benefit to taxpayers is a long-term benefit. 
of seeking to ensure that our immigration system is uh, bringing people to join us as American citizens, as legal permanent residents first, uh, who can stand on their own two feet, who will not be reliant on the welfare system, especially in the age of the modern welfare state, which is so expansive um, and expensive, frankly. The new rule includes services afforded to legal immigrants under current law, such as housing assistance, Medicaid, and food stamps. To break it all down, I'm joined by Teresa Cardinal Brown. She is the Director of Immigration and Cross Border Policy at the Bipartisan Policy Center in Washington, D.C. Thanks so much, Teresa, for being here. Um, talk to me about how this will impact um, immigrants and the legal immigration process in the United States and who will be most impacted by this new rule. Sure. So the, the rule applies to those who are applying to get green cards in the United States. Um, and so one of the longstanding issues in immigration law, as you mentioned, is whether or not someone would beco become a public charge. That has been broadly defined as somebody who would be mostly dependent on the government. It's a, it's a criteria that has been I'd say used sparingly, uh, over, especially over the last couple of decades, but has been a priority of this administration to implement. So it would look at whether or not uh, people who are applying to be green card holders have used public benefits that they might be eligible for. It would apply to current immigrants or citizens who are looking to sponsor others to come on green cards. And it would apply to some non-immigrants who are looking to extend or change their status as well. What can you tell us about how much immigrants use public benefits in comparison to native-born Americans? So we did a literature review a couple of years ago about, about who uses public benefits. And what we found is general individual immigrants use benefits uh, less often and at lower rates uh, than U.S. citizens do. But some immigrant-headed households, particularly those with U.S. citizen children, may use more of them because the children are eligible for benefits that maybe the immigrant parents are not. Critics of this new rule say that this is the Trump administration again unfairly targeting immigrants. There are talks that there are going to be swift legal challenges to this. How does this new rule um, really factor into how the Trump administration has overall used its immigration agenda to target different groups? Well, particularly its regulatory agenda has been about legal immigrants. And one of the things that we have seen is that a lot of the uh, regulatory changes that have been implemented have been about uh, reducing eligibility for legal immigrants immigration, uh, reducing the number of people who can qualify for legal immigration or slowing down the legal immigration process. You said the, the term public charge has been kind of implemented and enforced sparingly. Tell us a little bit about the history of the term public charge and how certain immigrant groups have been um, subject to, to that term and what it's meant to overall and in the years coming. Well, the idea of preventing the poor or paupers from immigrating has been around basically since the beginning of the republic. Initially, when the United States was created, states had control over who could immigrate and they would look for people who they thought might not be eligible to able to work or support them themselves. In the 1800s, Congress passed the first sort of uniform immigration rule, was the Chinese Exclusion Act, that also included this public charge rule. But over the years, it has been very subjectively enforced. So, for example, during the Ellis Island days, they would look at whether or not they, somebody, they thought somebody was physically able of performing work. Um, did they have family members already here or sponsors? Did they bring any money with them? So it was sort of on the fly. Uh, this has been a priority of this administration to get a public charge rule published since the administration came in. Uh, an executive order was issued very early in the presidency asking for this to be done. Um, so it's it's new in that we don't know exactly how it's going to be implemented. It's still a relatively subjective standard, especially that prospective looking part. Is an immigrant likely to become a public charge? That's where it's a little more iffy because they're going to look at things like, does the immigrant have a work history? What's their education level? Um, do they have any health issues that might affect whether or not they would uh, become a public charge? We have to kind of see how that would be implemented. But we've already seen some of this because consulates overseas have been have been implementing some of this through the visa review process over the last year already. Now I want to turn to a major story from last week. Some 680 immigrants were arrested during immigration raids at food processing centers in Mississippi. What goes into such raids and what legal consequences, if any, might employers face? So a raid like that is, of that size and scope has probably been in process for many, many months. Um, it, it probably was based on some information that Immigration Customs Enforcement received that those employers are employing undocumented immigrants. Then they also collaterally arrested undocumented immigrants they found on the premises. 
Now ICE will go through all that documents that they found during those search warrants uh, to see if they have enough evidence to proceed with prosecutions of those employers. So we may see some prosecutions, but historically it's been much more difficult to prosecute employers for knowingly hiring undocumented immigrants than it has been to arrest the undocumented immigrants themselves and see them deported. Well, lots of immigration news. Thanks so much for joining us. Teresa Cardinal-Brown of the Bipartisan Policy Center. Thank you. With six months before the first in the nation Iowa caucuses, more than 20 presidential hopefuls descended on the Hawkeye State this weekend. As Lisa Desjardins reports, voters were navigating crowds of people and the crowded candidate field. Welcome to the Iowa State Fair, a mix of high political stakes and high blood sugar, all on a stick or on a soapbox. Hello, Iowa. You have a very important choice to make. It's going to be a test for all of us. This is the moment we bring our people together. That's why I'm here asking for your support. The soapbox, where candidates each get 20 minutes, has never held more presidential weight. 23 contenders, including one GOP challenger to President Trump, will come and go throughout the fair. And with each one comes a walking mosh pit of press attention. None more so than former Vice President Joe Biden. Well, I gotta get there. Here we go. The jungle gym. Who barely had room at his own press conference. Biden has been here before in failed runs in 1988 and 2008, but he's never had the lead in Iowa until now, and it's a large, nearly 10 point lead. Go, Joe! His supporters feel they know him, they trust him. I like Joe Biden. You know, I enjoyed him when he was with Obama and stuff, and so I think he would definitely be a good candidate for sure. But opponents question if Biden sparks enough passion. How do you do that? Look at the polls. So far, so good. I, I do it by being me. Look, no one's ever, including reporters, cover me all the time. No one's ever doubted I mean what I say. The problem is sometimes I say all that I mean. It's everything. Matt Paul has deep roots with the Democratic Party in Iowa. He ran Hillary Clinton's winning Iowa campaign in 2016. Despite Biden's early lead, Paul says the state is still up for grabs. He's popular here, uh, but he has work to do. He's got to be here more. I think he's got to uh, talk about the future. Some voters are more blunt about Biden. If he was the primary candidate, I would still vote for him, but I I don't want him to be the candidate. I want someone new and fresh. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Among those angling as new and fresh is California Senator Kamala Harris. Third in Iowa polls, her staff is energetic and her fair crowd was large. But she dipped in the last poll here and admits she's still building. We have over 65 staff in Iowa and there are people in this race who have had national profiles for many years. I'm still introducing myself to people. 2020 is our big chance. Quickly surging here is Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren, now second in the Iowa polls and captain of what many see as the best organized ground game in the state with fired up volunteers like Joey Odding. I think it's important that we just take a new, almost radical, not to call Elizabeth Warren radical, but take a big change in direction. This is a problem for Bernie Sanders. Let me make a major announcement. Pretty good. The Vermont senator is still popular in Iowa, but losing the most ground to Warren. Over one million people will come to the Iowa State Fair, and that is a prime political audience, especially for the many Democrats trying to break into the top tier. So thanks for bringing your talent. The problem? There are just so many candidates, and they're seemingly everywhere, flipping pork. How's that for a pork, huh? Pouring beer, counting corn kernels. Voters are overwhelmed. I'm a registered Democrat. I'm an open ticket voter, but I have no clue what I want to do. Booted edge, um, Biden. Biden, I like Beto, but we'll see how it goes with that. I agree with what Biden has to say, but I also agree with, with Warren and what Sanders has to say. So I'm, right now I'm kind of conflicted. And thus, candidates are self-separating in groups. The Midwesterners, 
How do you break out? I think you do it the old-fashioned way. You just keep reaching out to people and you meet people. When people hear what I have to say, especially coming from Ohio and being in Iowa, it's very similar uh, culturally. Those focused on personal contact. I've had a lot of town halls, lots of events at breweries, and it makes a difference because people can get to know me, I can get to know them and make sure I'm lifting up their voices. What I'm really focused on is doing what we're doing out here today, really getting down into communities here in Iowa, New Hampshire, and other parts of the country. I believe that um, as the, the race gets smaller and smaller, uh, people pay more attention to the candidates. And the I can get it done policy folks. The way we break out is by just keep hammering the message to the American people that we need solutions, not sound bites, and that it's not their imagination. When the field shrinks, they're going to start focusing on ideas, who's got the best ideas, who's the best person to beat Trump, and that's when I think I can break through. I just got to keep finding fresh ways to, to talk about what we did in Colorado, and most importantly, how we brought people together. And then there's New Jersey Senator Cory Booker, who says he's already rising in less noticed metrics like endorsements and staff. The people that have gone on are people more like me. The people like Jimmy Carter, or Barack Obama, or Bill Clinton are people who were considered long shots this far out. But what they were doing was they were building incredible organizations here in Iowa. There's another issue for Democrats in Iowa, beating President Trump in a state he won by nine points. I like Trump. I like Trump. He's just a, he's just a guy. He's not a politician. He's just a guy like, like me. Here, the move by Democrats to the left for the primary is pushing some away. They're so liberal. They just don't even want to move on in this world. They want everything to be a socialism. They want everything to be calm and nice and everybody loves everybody. But, you know, sometimes you got to get out and get a little aggressive. At the Iowa State Fair this week, scenes of whirling Americana, rows of fried food and some 40,000 prize ribbons. Rush TDX. But for candidates, far less reward. Traditionally, just the top three finishers in Iowa are thought to have a real shot at the nomination. The fair marks the end of summer for the state, but it's the beginning of the real heat in the race for president. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Lisa Desjardins at the Iowa State Fair in Des Moines. Of course, the Iowa State Fair stretches on until next Sunday, and there are still a few candidates for fairgoers to see, including tomorrow's soapbox headliner, that's South Bend, Indiana Mayor Pete Buttigieg. But for now, this is a good place to start our Politics Monday Roundup with Tamara Keith of NPR and co-host of the NPR Politics Podcast and Shauna Thomas, D.C. Bureau Chief for Vice News. Thanks to you both for being here. Good Thanks to be with you. So no fried foods, no butter sculptures, but a lot of politics to talk about. Yes. Let's do it. The Iowa State Fair, Tam, it's supposed to be an opportunity for candidates to break away from the pact, take a chance to shine if they can, or kind of continue in the middle and fight for air. Did anyone stand out to you over the last few days? Yeah, and so I was there. I was technically on vacation. I did eat fried foods, but I also... I, I, you can't you played political off. tourist. I played political tourist. You can't turn it off. Um, and so what I saw is that uh, candidates like Kamala Harris and Elizabeth Warren, who are not at the very top in the polls, um, drew very large crowds of very interested people who came early and stayed late and watched their speeches. Uh, in fact, for Warren, uh, when she was speaking at the soapbox, you actually couldn't walk past uh, the the entire uh, grand passageway or whatever it's called the, <laughs> the the big road in the middle of the fairgrounds was just completely congested with people who had stopped to watch her speak um, and uh, so uh, that and that sort of reflects what you've seen in the polls which is that Elizabeth Warren uh, you know taking as many selfies as she has to take mm -hmm. uh, at every event um, has begun to uh, sort of notch things up in Iowa. I believe in, in the latest Iowa poll, she's in, it's in second uh, behind Joe Biden. Shauna, every selfie matters at this stage, but it's worth reminding people still over six months away before anyone in Iowa casts a vote. How much does this matter this cycle? I mean, <laughs> how much does the Iowa State Fair actually matter in any cycle? Like Ever. the thing is, yes. we, you know, what our correspondent on Vice News was telling me, and she was out there as well, was that there was so 
much media there that she was confused as to whether the candidates were actually able to speak to Iowans one on one. And so, yes, you have the Des Moines Register soapbox. We all enjoy seeing that. It's a good way for a candidate to get their stump speech out there. But also, the point of the Iowa State Fair and visiting, sort of historically, has been to try to have those one on one interactions with Iowans right. and to sort of like, and, and the thing is, you know, what one guy told us was like, all Iowans are here. It's not just a Democratic Party event. It's not some special interest event. You could run into anyone, but it's also kind of hard, apparently, to do with the amount of media that's there. But hopefully some of them took advantage of having those conversations with people who would not necessarily be able to see them or want to see them at, like, a general Democratic event or something like that. So they want to get as much attention as they can. Yeah. Not all attention is good attention, though. One of the storylines we've been talking about is how former Vice President Joe Biden has done so far in some of these events. I want to play for you guys just a couple of quick sound bites. They're from two different events, one from Thursday, one from Saturday. But these are the kinds of comments from Mr. Biden that are getting attention right now. Take a listen. Poor kids are just as bright and just as talented as white kids, wealthy kids, black kids. I watched what happened when those kids from Parkland came up to see me when I was vice president. So, you know, Tam, we're calling these gaffes in this conversation, right? He misspeaks, he corrects himself, sometimes he has to come back and correct himself a little later. Is it fair criticism of him right now? Uh, it is Joe Biden. Joe Biden uh, has called himself a gaff machine. He, uh, this is a, sort of a trademark. Uh, he, he, he does this. He's done this his entire political career. Uh, when he announced that he was going to run for president, that he was running for president, you knew that this was going to happen, and it has continued to happen all along. One thing that's been sort of puzzling to me is why this weekend is the weekend that everyone started to talk about. Well, will Joe Biden's gaffes matter? Um, and I think that the way they could matter is if voters decide that it's an indicator of something larger. It's a, it, if it taps into a concern that voters have, uh, perhaps about his age um, or, or some other thing like that. Um, but that Joe Biden would say the wrong words or stumble is not new. Yeah, what do you think, but Alice? I think the thing is, when he said the wrong words and stumbled historically when we've both covered him before, it's it's Uncle Joe. It's like, oh, okay, Joe Biden, he's great, like, whatever. And much like, in some ways, the the awkward touching and that kind of thing. But when you're the front runner for to be president and everyone thinks you may actually have a shot at getting the Democratic nomination, everyone is going to pay even more attention to every little stumble. And I do think that is going to get worse. Now, some of why this has been highlighted is that Trump's team is the one who sort of pushed this narrative a bit. I am interested to see if, like, a lower-tier presidential candidate goes along this narrative, like a one who's actually on the Democratic side. Because, of course, President Trump is going to push this. He wants to beat Biden. He thinks Biden's the guy to beat. But does the do the Cory Bookers of the world or does someone else start trying to talk about Joe Biden's age and play these gaffes or anything like that? Does it cause Democratic infighting? And I think that's something to be more worried about at this stage for Biden. You mentioned President Trump, and I want to ask you about something else. Over the weekend, he retweeted a post from a comedian linking the Clintons to the death of Jeffrey Epstein, uh, the accused sex trafficker in jail this weekend. We're not showing it here because it is a conspiracy theory. It is baseless. It traces back years to some far-right conspiracy theories. Uh, Shauna, of all the things the president could have been tweeting about this weekend, why this? Because he, I mean, I, I can't get into the president's head, and I can't pretend to be in the president's head, but he saw something. It attacked the Clintons. He is still attacking the Clintons. People still cheer, lock her up at his at his events, um, at his campaign events. And and you know what? He pressed retweet. And this is just what he does. He has spread other conspiracy theories. We can go all the way back to Barack Obama's birth certificate. Um, now, yes, he could have been tweeting about other things like, hey, does the Bureau of Prisons have a staffing problem? What is going on there? There are some real issues with Epstein and will his victims be able to see justice and that kind of thing. But, you know, this is what the president likes to do and now we're talking about it. Tammy has 63 million Twitter followers. There is, you know, I've been in countries where conspiracy theories and misinformation campaigns are very active. It has an impact. Do, do you worry about that here? Is there concern? We are also in a country where conspiracy theories have been very active, especially in recent years, especially with social media. And President Trump has at times retweeted or otherwise trafficked in conspiracy theories. So that he is doing this now is not really out of character. It's something that he does. Uh, and I think that we are in a time in this country where conspiracy theories, for whatever reason, are particularly sticky. And 
especially on the right, but not entirely on the right, also very much on the left, conspiracy theories um, have taken hold. And, and so this is, this is sort of, this is where we are. And the question really, I mean, the larger question that comes out of this conspiracy theory thing is that what do we do about, this, about social media? Mm -hmm. And are we going to hold social media companies accountable for the spread of things that are not true? And this is something Congress has been talking about and they have been trying to tackle, but they haven't done anything yet. I think this reiterates that that conversation is really important. Another conversation. Yes. We'll have another time. There will be so many. <laughs> Shauna Thomas of Vice News, Tamara Keith of NPR. Thanks to you both. You're Thanks. welcome. The Trump administration is making some of the broadest changes in years to the Endangered Species Act, the landmark law signed by President Richard Nixon that's been credited with saving iconic species like the bald eagle and the grizzly bear. William Brangham explores what today's changes could mean. That's right, Amna. The Endangered Species Act currently protects about 1,600 species in the U.S. by limiting the activities that could harm those species. And it's been overwhelmingly successful in protecting those plants and animals. But the act has been a target for Republican lawmakers and industry groups for years. They argue these protections cost too many jobs and too much money. Now, the Trump administration is proposing changes that one Democratic lawmaker referred to as taking a wrecking ball to the act. Joining me now is New York Times environmental reporter Lisa Friedman. Lisa Friedman, welcome back to the News Hour. Thanks so much for having me. Before we get to the administration's proposed changes, what can we say, what, what species can we credit are alive today because of the Endangered Species Act? The Endangered Species Act has helped to save from extinction some of the most well-known plant and animal species in the country. The bald eagle, the grizzly bear, the humpback whale are all species that owe a tremendous amount to the protection of the Endangered Species Act. As I mentioned before, the Republican lawmakers for decades have hated this law, wanted to dial it back. Industry groups have said the same, saying it's too costly, it's not really helping as much as it is hurting our, our industries. What is the Trump administration proposing with these new changes? There's a number of changes in the final rules that were issued today. Um, a number of them are ones that environmental groups fear will severely weaken protections for plant and animal species. Uh, I'll list just two of the big ones for now. One of them is a measure that would weaken the ability of scientists to protect species against the threats of climate change. Another is a, is a, a uh, phrase that would introduce the ability of the federal government to include economic analyses. An analysis meaning if we're going to protect X species, it might cost us Y amount of money. Absolutely right. Currently, the way the law reads, um, scientists can only consider one thing when they're deciding whether or not to list a species as threatened or endangered, the science. Is it threatened? Should it be listed? Um, that language is going to be eliminated. And what replaces it will give the federal government the ability to conduct analyses, just as you described, to find out whether listing a species will cost money, will cost money and perhaps lost development. Um, the, the Interior Department has, has insisted that this won't change anything, that decisions will still be made purely on the basis of science. They just want to have the information and be able to know the information when, when these, these listing possibilities come up. These changes are coming amidst a lot of news about endangered species. We saw the UN a few months ago put out this report indicating that upwards of a million plant and animal species globally could be threatened if we don't change our ways. Yeah. Help me understand what the administration is arguing here. Are they saying here in the US we're doing endangered species protection just fine or are they saying we can do it in a better way? What, what are they arguing? Yeah. I think, you know, what we've heard from the administration is that it's possible to both be stewards of the environment while also cutting red tape. And, and their argument is that that is what they're doing with this, with this regulation today. Is there a sense that if these changes go through, any particular species that might be impacted? You know, one of the ones we hear about a lot 
are um, are one are species that are affected by climate change, and you know, one that comes to mind easily is the polar bear. Um, the polar bear habitat is going to be affected dramatically by climate change. Uh, As some, their sea ice and their habitat disappears year after year. Exactly. Some of these changes are far into the future. Whether this new regulation hamstrings scientists' ability to take action to protect these species um, is something that, that environmental groups are, are very worried about. We know these are proposed rules. Probably going to be some lawsuits, right? What, what's the future look like? Today we heard from the attorneys general of Massachusetts and California. Um, they have vowed to sue. Senator Udall, who you mentioned, uh, said that he's going to be looking at legislative measures to block this in Congress. It seems that with the makeup of this Congress, it's going to be very hard to pass anything that would block this legislatively. So I, I think the uh, some of these questions about whether this regulation will stand the test of time are going to be answered in the courts. Lisa Friedman of The New York Times, thank you. Thank you. Nancy Armour is a sports columnist for USA Today. In her latest piece, Armour said, quote, Simone Biles isn't just best gymnast of her time. She's an athlete for the ages. She joins me now from Chicago. Nancy, thanks for being with us. So the triple-double is two flips with three twists. Just how big a deal is this move? It is huge. It's the physics of it alone are really unbelievable almost. I mean, consider the fact that she is turning herself end over end twice, but at the same time, she is twisting her body around three times. You have to have the physics of that exactly right, or you basically will stop in the air and kind of plop to the ground. And she also has to know exactly where she is in the air. Otherwise, she could do some real damage if she's off at all. The power and the strength that it takes to do this is is really nothing short of amazing. And, and obviously, this is why it has taken so long for a woman to even try it, let alone land it like she did. You wrote in your column, she got so much height that if there was an SUV parked on the floor, she would have cleared it. And it's worth noting it was one of two record-breaking moves she made, right? Yes, she also did a double 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 off uh, dismount off of balance beam, which is a double twisting double double somersault. And what makes that so amazing is that she's basically at a complete standstill before she does it. So imagine you are trying to dunk a basketball from flat feet. Um, it's not exactly comparable, but it's pretty close. So what she's doing, the power and the strength that she has. To, to get these moved, it, it's unmatched, and not just in her sport, I would say in, in pretty much any sport. And it's worth noting, too, that that little interview piece we just heard from her, which was just days prior to her giving this performance. I mean, the fact that she is out there still competing for USA Gymnastics, speaking out so bravely about the abuse she said she suffered, and then giving performances like this, what does that say to you about Simone Biles? She's not only an amazing athlete, she's an amazing person. And Simone recognizes the power that she has and the influence she has. Uh, she is the best thing that USA Gymnastics has going and, and has had going for the last couple of years. And she picks her spots and she picks what she wants to say and, and how she wants to say it. But she recognizes that, that she has an influence and that she can hold USA Gymnastics feet to the fire and, and the USOC and even Congress because she is the best gymnast in the history of her sport, and she's been failed. And somebody has to answer to that. And she continues to, to point that out and, and demand that they do right, not just by her, but the other hundreds of women who were abused by Larry Nassar. Nancy, there's a reason that that move from over this weekend has gone viral. People know that they're watching greatness when they see it go by. You wrote about this in your column. You compared it to Muhammad Ali's Rumble in the Jungle, uh, Serena Williams winning the Australian Open when she was pregnant. You mentioned Simone Biles being one of the best gymnasts of all time. Is it fair to say she's one of the best athletes of all time? I, I think so. Um, I, I'm... I was struck last night that this is going to be one of these things, and, and I've seen her do many spectacular things, it, it, many of them. But this is one of those things that a decade from now, two decades from now, I'll be able to picture it in my mind. If somebody says Simone Biles triple-double or what was the best movie you ever saw Simone Biles do, this will immediately come to mind. And I think that is the mark of an athlete who is transcendent, not just in their own sport, but across sports. And 
if she doesn't qualify, then I don't know who does. <laughs> We're all lucky to watch that greatness in action. Nancy Armour of USA Today, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Star Wars creator George Lucas and Game of Thrones author George R. R. Martin have cited him as an influence on their work, helping them to imagine what an adventure story might look like. Now, N.C. Wyeth, who led a family of American art royalty, gets a new look in an exhibition of his illustrations and paintings. Jeffrey Brown reports for our ongoing arts and culture series, Canvas. The beautiful Brandywine River Valley in Pennsylvania. Inspiration and home to Newell Converse, better known as N.C. Wyeth. Today, it's also home to the Brandywine River Museum of Art in Chad's Ford, which is giving Wyeth a new look. It was Robert Louis Stevenson who wrote the beloved adventure tale, Treasure Island. But for millions of Americans beginning in the early 20th century, it was Wyeth who created the lasting images of pirates and much more. The personal painting, the illustration, he did mural work, he did advertising work. So his reach into the different aspects of visual culture is, is so broad. Christine Podmanitsky is co-curator of the exhibition N.C. Wyeth New Perspectives. The goal here, to present a more well-rounded portrait of an artist who painted scenes of rural life here and in coastal Maine, where he had a residence, but who remains best known for his book illustrations, the smaller reproductions of his large-scale paintings for such classic children's stories as Robin Hood, Last of the Mohicans, King Arthur. Wyeth's genius, says Podmanitsky, was to find just the right moment in the story to bring to life. As when young Jim Hawkins first leaves home in Treasure Island. I said goodbye to Mother in the Cove. That's all Stevenson writes. That's it. Uh, that's, One it. Line. that's it. Yeah. All he writes about Jim Hawkins leaving home, going off on this exploit where he's to um, search for treasure. But when you look at the painting, you see how much N.C. Wyeth has brought here in the form of emotion. First of all, the characters themselves, the look on Jim Hawkins' face, but his use of shadow, the sharp lines, mm -hmm. the sort of cloud over the mother, posture, all sorts of things heighten the sense of, of what's going on. Wyeth's first breakthrough in 1902 was a cover for the Saturday Evening Post, imagery of an already past and mythic American West. He created magazine advertisements, including for Cream of Wheat. It was a time before television and our own screen-saturated lives, the golden age of illustration, and Wyeth was at its forefront. The commissions allowed him to buy property here in Pennsylvania and to support the other part of his life for which he became best known, as patriarch of an American art family dynasty, father of five children, three of them painters, most famously the youngest, Andrew. Andrew Wyeth would become one of the biggest names in 20th century American art, also focusing on his hometown of Chad's Ford and summer home in Maine including the celebrated Christina's World from 1948. Andrew's son, N.C.'s grandson, is Jamie Wyatt. This is the grounds of your childhood, huh? Yeah, my grandfather's orchard and whatnot, and then my aunt used this N studio. Uh, Jamie, now 73 and also a prominent painter, first learned to draw in the grand studio N.C. built here. Jamie never knew his grandfather, who died in 1945 at age 62 in a car accident at a railroad crossing. The studio is owned by the Brandywine Museum. Is this pretty much the way it was when you were a kid? Totally. It hasn't been changed at all. It's as if he walked out of it yesterday. He painted this giant mural for a Wilmington bank. And my father told me that when he'd work on these enormous murals, he'd, you know, put a line or a brush stroke on and then walk back to see the visual effect. So he'd go up and back and up and back. Back and, and forth, yeah, putting them in action. I mean, it's pretty loosely and thinly done when you yeah. get up to it, but to do this Actually, expression is, yeah. and yeah. then get back, knowing this thing would be 50 feet from the viewer and whatnot. Mm -hmm. uh, 
All around, the collection of items he gathered for his book illustrations. Coming to this studio was magical to me because here it was full of costumes and cutlasses and flintlocks and, and a lot of his illustrations were still in the back room here. So I go through them for hours. This was like this the amusement park oh in a way. Oh my God, yeah. it was just magical. My father, of course, I would pump him with asking him about N.C. Wyeth, and, and he said he wanted the paintings to leap out of the page as you read them, to grab you by the neck, and, uh, and they sure do. As the show makes clear, though, N.C. also had larger ambitions, to be taken seriously as a fine artist rather than just a successful commercial illustrator. Much of the exhibition's second floor displays the more personal paintings Wyeth created largely for himself as well as two from his late-in-life first solo exhibition in a New York gallery. Among those, Island Funeral, which uses paint Wyeth made from dyes he received from the nearby DuPont Company. And that's how he gets these beautiful, deep, sort of jewel-like tones here. There's a lot of, of tension going on here between the old-fashioned, say, bird's-eye view, the new cutting-edge dyes, the death of an island patriarch. Mm -hmm. Well, N.C. Wyeth is in his late 50s at this point. Um, he is already been publicized, if you will, as the patriarch of his own family. So there are thoughts, I think, of mortality. There are also signs of Wyeth, a traditional artist, flicking at some of the more modern painting techniques of his time. This is one of the most fascinating paintings as far as technique goes because mm. you have him here trying to capture the light on this chain mail or armor mm. and it's just a magnificent piece of painting. Mm -hmm. And grandson Jamie goes so far as to see in this exhibition an unusual kind of group show all by one painter. He tried so many different techniques, so many different approaches. Some are very Cezanne-like, broken color, impressionistic. Tried them all, which is wonderful, I guess, you know. There's a wonderful little self-portrait of him looking. It's just teeny and just very delicately done. Painting, Jamie says, has been the family passion. It was sort of like another world, mm -hmm. the comparing the three generations and so forth. And, and I happen to adore their work. I mean, these two individuals, very different individuals, very different approaches to painting. Um, I mean, what a thing to build on. The elder Wyeth himself, though, never achieved the recognition he craved. He looked at it and thought his life had just been doing these children's books and... Uh, it's hard for me to conceive that, though, I and mean, he had to have looked. I remember my mother, she said, when she first met him, she was very young, and she said, oh, Mr. Wyeth, I, I love your illustrations of Treasure Island, and he said, you'll grow out of that. Really? Hmm. And, and he was wrong. <laughs> N.C. Wyeth New Perspectives is at the Brandywine River Museum of Art through September 15th. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Jeffrey Brown in Chadsford, Pennsylvania. The exhibit moves next to the Portland Museum of Art in Maine and in 2020 to the Taft Museum of Art in Cincinnati. And that is the NewsHour for tonight. I'm Amna Nawaz. Join us online and again here tomorrow evening. For all of us here at the PBS NewsHour, thank you. We'll see you soon.